Welcome to our weekday devotions, and today is for the 21st of May. I'm bringing our look into the book of Habakkuk to a, a, an end today, and, and we come to some of the most famous words in the whole book of Habakkuk. Chapter 3, verse 16 to 19. Let me read those words to you. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there is no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation, God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. It's interesting to notice that as you move through the book of Habakkuk, you, you move from his trembling frustration in chapter 1, verse 2, to trembling awe, chapter 3, verse 16, from despair, chapter 1, to unshakable joy, chapter 3, verse 18. I suppose the natural question is, how? How do you do that in strange, dark days? It's interesting to just remind ourselves, Habakkuk lived in dark and difficult days. The heavy hand of the sewage of sin was destroying the society of Judah around him. Injustice, rampant pride, narcissistic indulgence and greed. But God's answers to Habakkuk's prayer seemed worse than the problem. God raised up the Babylonian Empire to judge Judah and the nations. With frightening honesty, Habakkuk, in confusion and frustration, struggles throughout the book to understand God's strange ways in his day. We saw how in agonizing faith he takes all his questions and frustration to God in prayer in chapter 2, verse 1. And it's interesting that at that moment, the, the breaking point almost, the Lord answers with some of the most helpful words for all such Habakkuk's. Chapter 2, verse 4. The righteous shall live by faith. We've learned three things, or we're learning three things about this faith that Habakkuk learned. Number one is simply that faith eclipses sight, the situation I'm living in. Chapter 2, verse 1, he went up on the watchtower to watch for the Lord. It recognizes the circumstances, but it looks beyond to see that God is ultimately ruling over even dark and difficult days. Secondly, as we saw yesterday, that faith rests on God's word and work. Chapter 2, verse 20. It finds security in the fact that God will work out his promised rule. But finally today, we discover that faith opens the door for circumstance-free joy. I think that's really where the verses at the end of Habakkuk land. Now, in fact, the change is so stark from despair to joy that it leads liberal scholars to argue certainly this must be another person injecting their thoughts. But I think that's just to profoundly misunderstand the reality of true faith. What's most striking in these words is remembering that the circumstances had not changed for Habakkuk. It was just as dire. It's beginning, chapter 1, verse 2. Babylon was still marching. Sight shouted there was no hope. But faith looked beyond to the future destination that God has determined. Now, how did he get there? That's the question we want to ask today. We saw yesterday that he had come to the place that he had placed his hope in God's promises, not his situation. In chapter 3, 
we find him going another way, and that is simply he reminds himself what God has done. He recounts the history of Israel, how God had repeatedly carried and cared for his people. We never come to a blank sheet with God, do we? His resume is one of utter faithfulness, time and time again. Interestingly, it's to watch simply how he grows in his understanding of the wonder of God as he goes through this remembering in chapter 3. In verse 3, he uses the word God, Eloah, a rather generic title for God. Everyone used that. But when he gets to verse 8, he uses Yahweh, Jah Jehovah, the covenant special name that God gave to his people alone. He is the God who always and forever loyally loves his people. And finally, chapter verse 19, at the end of the chapter, Yahweh Adonai, the covenant Lord who has proved his faithfulness through direct personal action. I think one of the keys we learn here is to go back and remember. To remember his word and in his word how he has time and again been faithful to his people. Even through difficult and dark days. Our days are not new. Time and again God has taken his people through such days. And then simply to go back and to remember how in our own lives... He has also been faithful time and again. Then notice how as he remembers, he then reasons that through to joy. In verse 17, he piles one disaster upon another for an agrarian society. No fruit, no nothing in the barns. And then notice in verse 18, he reasons nevertheless. As history affirms time and again, God will keep his promises. History is his story, and he has determined the final end. Friends, these days at most are a small paragraph in his great masterpiece of bringing about all that he has won upon the cross of Calvary. He's already written the final chapter. Colin Smith puts it this way, History is his kitchen, which is preparing a feast beyond imagination for all his people. Habakkuk prays for good, but he refuses to tie his joy to the unpredictable passing clouds of his day. He ties his deepest joy in the final feast, which already has a seat ready and waiting for him. We have even greater ground to stand on today than Habakkuk. The cross of Jesus and his resurrection effectively set the table for the feast. We see God's word and work enacted at the cross. How much more secure is our joy as we await for that day? As Habakkuk in his uncertain days, we can find our hope and security in the certainty that this day will pass. Our lives will be found in the fold at the feet of Jesus' robes one day. And one day we will stand in the untroubled, incorruptible, pure joy of all that Jesus triumphed and won upon the cross. That nothing in our day, not hell, not COVID, not the troubles of our world around us, can ever separate us from the sheer joy that we will know standing beside the Lord Jesus on that day. That joy, in hope, can carry us through all the questions and tears and uncertainties, even of this day. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. 
Gracious Lord, we confess that, that many of us find ourselves overwhelmed at times with a tsunami of doubts and questions and, to be honest, fears. The present shouts in our hearts that it has the final say. We bring all these concerns and voices to you. And like Habakkuk on the watchtower, we simply wait and pray for you to come. Remind us afresh today that not only are our times in your hands, but also all time is in your hand. Today, with its fears and questions, it is nothing more than a small paragraph in your grand masterpiece of all that you have accomplished in one through our Lord Jesus. One of unshakable joy we shall one day know. Help us to turn back and remember in these days your unerring faithfulness. Your faithfulness through the ages and through our own lives. And that you have set the end of our story to be alongside the end of all that you have accomplished one day. We ask for your peace for these fearful times, particularly for those who are concerned about returning to schools or to work. Help us remind ourselves that if we have to do these things, we are no less in your hands then than we are right now. Give wisdom to parents who wrestle through the concerns of their children and the need to return to normality. We pray for the teachers who consider taking up once more the calling to teach young people, and we pray that you may Grant them wisdom. We ask for wisdom for the employers and those in authority to, as they balance the needs to provide for return to work and safety for those returning. Be with those facing unemployment. As you have provided in the past, we pray that you'll encourage them to know with confidence you will provide in the coming days and months and years. Help them to learn in this new place how to work out trust in your unfailing care. We continue to ask that you will bring healing to all those who are unwell. We give you thanks that you've kept Bethel House and Sunrise free of the virus. Strengthen all those working in the health services, in all the hospitals and wards in this area. And we particularly bring to you those who sit with and serve on wards where there are those who are terminally ill. May you give them love, help them to serve well. Every morning, wake them up with new grace as they trust you and renew within them fresh hope each day. All these things we bring to your hands, and we ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, may the Lord bless you. Have a really good day. God bless.